I'm Lev Wood. My pronouns are he and him. I'm affectionately known as Rev Lev, and I'm the minister here at Akatink Unitarian Universalist Church. So happy to be with you this morning. I encourage you, if you're in person, to silence your phone. And whether you're in person or online, we're going to center ourselves for worship. We open and welcome to the ancestral people of this land, acknowledging that our church, like all of Burke, rests on the unceded territory of the Manahoac tribe of the Great Sioux Nation. We seek healing and the realization of justice with the people of this land who live on and their descendants, the present day members of the Monacan Indian Nation, the Patawomic Indian Tribe of Virginia and the Piscataway Indian Nation. We honor the ancestors as we move toward healing so that together, all, to, all together shall one day know full justice. I love a bright, sunny Sunday morning, especially with crisp air, not too crisp, just perfect. I'm Paulette Lichtman-Panzer, and I'm your worship associate for today. I hope that you got a name tag or have put your name on your Zoom name tag. If you need help with that, let us know in the chat. If you aren't new to Akatink, look around. Do you see people you haven't met or haven't spoken to in a while? Help us live up to our mission to be a welcoming and inclusive spiritual home for all by reaching out and making a connection. By visiting this congregation, newcomers are in a period of transition and we will want to get to know them and help them to know us. Whether you're a longtime member or a newcomer or something in between, we encourage you to stay for our social hour. You can get a cup of coffee. Sometimes there's some goodies over there in the back by the kitchen. We encourage you to stay and um, just have a, another chance to talk with other people after the service itself. And we recognize that this is the season for nonviolence. And we often try to um, have our children participate in a service wherever it's appropriate. And so I understand that Myra Passa is going to come up and uh, provide for us all uh, the words that we should listen to. There is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives by Audre Lorde. So this is our month exploring transformation, one of our new proposed UU values. And we've done kind of the yummy stuff earlier in the month. We looked at uh, what it means to grow in spirit together, which comes also from our mission statement. And we shared examples of people living the question, living their, the answer to the questions they have in their life inspired by the famous quote from Rainer Maria Rilke. And today we're gonna to talk about in, intimate partner violence, which is not the most fun topic. That's why I say we did the, the yummy stuff earlier. But I think you'll find it in, an engaging call to action. And I think we'll, we'll all learn something together. And then next Sunday, anybody know what next Sunday is? It's, it's a little early in the, in the year. Easter, yeah, next, next Sunday is Easter. And I mentioned last week that uh, sometimes folks say, you know, why, why do Unitarian Universalists, what do we have to say about Easter? Um, but I think we have a lot to say about Easter, and I'll give you a little, uh, not a hint, but window into next week. We're actually going to look at the Sumerian myth of Inanna and her descent into the underworld and then her, her coming back from the underworld. And that's going to be a, a multi-generational service, so we're going to do that all together uh, adults, children, youth, everybody all together. Doesn't that sound fun? Yeah. A little bit different take yeah. on Easter? Yeah. So, and then the... <laughs> and, and next month, our theme will be interdependence, and I'm excited about that as well. So, and, and Easter will be kind of a bridge service as we look at how transformation happens as we strip away the non-essential and as we're reborn to our deeper selves. 
and also how that happens in community because we're interdependent selves. Hello, I'm Olivia Tuggle. Pronouns are she, her. Um, today's time for all ages, we're going to read a gently told and tenderly illustrated story for children who have witnessed any kind of violence or traumatic episode. Children who have witnessed violence and other traumatic incidents at a surprise, are at a surprisingly greater risk for committing violence in the future than our children who have actually been involved in such events. The event might be a car accident, domestic violence, or school violence, suicide, or a natural disaster such as a tornado, a flood, or fire. Regardless of the type of incident, child witness, witnesses often react by trying to forget or ignore the experience. When their feelings are pushed underground in this manner, these children may begin to feel bad in ways they don't understand and become angry as a result of feeling bad. It is the anger that can give way to violence. Caring adults can make all the difference by helping children talk about and understand the experience. A Terrible Thing Happened by Margaret M. Holmes, illustrated by Carrie Pillow. Sherman Smith saw the most terrible thing. He was very upset. It really scared Sherman to see such a terrible thing. Sherman did not feel sure. Sorry. <laughs> Sherman did not like feeling so afraid. He did not want to remember what happened. So Sherman decided not to think about the terrible thing he saw. Sherman thought that would make him feel better. At first, the plan seemed to work. Sherman woke up every morning, he brushed his teeth, and he went to school. Sherman played with his friends, he teased his sister, and he walked his dog. Everything all seemed all right for a while, but something inside of Sherman was starting to bother him. Sherman had to play more, run faster, and sing louder in order to forget the terrible thing he saw. Other things started happening to Sherman too. Sometimes he did not feel hungry. Sometimes his stomach hurt or his head hurt. Sometimes he felt sad, but he didn't know why. Sometimes he was nervous for no reason at all. Sometimes he did not sleep very well. Sometimes when he did sleep, he would have very bad dreams. The bad dreams scared Sherman. All of these things made Sherman angry. It seemed like Sherman was angry all the time. Sherman started getting into trouble at school. Sometimes he felt so angry, he did mean things. Getting into trouble so often made Sherman feel bad. Sherman did not understand his bad feelings. He felt confused. Sometimes parents help children figure out their feelings. Sometimes teachers or other grown-ups help. That is how Sherman met Miss Maple. Miss Maple helped Sherman think about his feelings. He listened while Sherman talked to her. He played while they talked. Sherman did not feel as mixed up when he talked to Miss Maple. Once when Sherman and Miss Maple were coloring, she told him to draw a picture of how he felt when he was angry. It seemed like a strange thing to draw, but Sherman did it. After that, Sherman drew lots of pictures. Pictures of the step pain in his stomach, pictures of bad dreams he had, pictures of the fear he felt, and at last, pictures of the terrible thing he saw. Sherman and Miss Maple talked about the pictures. He asked if the terrible he saw was his fault. Sherman said he worried a lot about that. No, Miss Maple told Sherman, it was not your fault. Sherman told Miss Maple a lot of things. He told her about the bad dreams. He told her how scared he felt. It was very hard to do. Miss Maple was proud that Sherman was trying to talk about such hard things. 
Sherman found that it felt good to let out his feelings. Feeling good helped Sherman feel stronger. When Sherman felt stronger, he did not feel so angry. Nothing can change the terrible things that Sherman saw, but now he does not feel so mean. He is not so scared or worried. His stomach does not hurt as much, and the bad dreams hardly ever happened. Sherman Smith is feeling much better now. He just thought you would want to know. The reading is essentially excerpts from a book by Kelly Sonberg. I was 26, having spent most of my 20s delaying, delaying adulthood. And he was 24 and enjoyed a reputation as a partier. The pregnancy was a surprise, and we married four months later. We were together for almost two years before he was violent with me. First, he pushed me against a wall. It was two more years before he hit me, and another year or so after that before he hit me again. It happened so slowly and then so fast. Eight years later, the police came to our door. When the younger one asked about my foot, I said that it didn't hurt. I told him it was no big deal. But when he asked for my driver's license, I stood up and found that I could not walk. My foot was the size of a football and it was bleeding. The bowl that Caleb had shuddered on it wasn't a little bowl like I described to the policeman. It was a heavy ceramic serving bowl, and I would need to wear a soft boot for a month, get a tetanus shot, and there would always be a scar. A little star shot through the top of my foot. Our elderly neighbor developed dementia, and one night uh, thought a boy was hiding under her bed. Caleb stayed with her. When the child of an administrative assistant in Caleb's department needed a heart transplant, Caleb went to the assistant's house and helped him put down wood floors in the basement to create a playroom, a playroom for his little boy. When my dad needed help installing new windows in the house, or mowing the lawn or chopping wood, Caleb was always there ready to help. I was so grateful to be married to someone so generous with his time, so very loving. The day that I left him, I called Rebecca, a kind and accepting friend whom I knew would help. It was not an easy call to make. She lived with her partner and they let my son and me stay with them for a month until we got our own place. She and I had only known each other for about a year. I told her about the beatings, how Caleb broke my phone when I tried to call for help, how he pulled me out from underneath the bed by my ankles, how I hid shaking in the closet while he raged, how he always found me, how there was no safe place for me. When I saw the fear in her eyes, her friend said, I understood the magnitude of what was happening. After the arrest, I hobbled around in denial for a few days until a concerned friend pushed me into getting the foot examined. So we're going kind of back and forth in this woman's life. It's not just a straight progression of events. At the urgent care center, the doctor said when looking at my foot, this will take a long time to heal. It will change color over time. It will look like a sunset. As I drove home, I heard the words over and over. It will look like a sunset. 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 You can find that story on online. It's called It Will Look Like a Sunset. 
and hope that we were able to give you some of the spirit of it in that condensed excerpt. It's so difficult to talk about domestic violence. Even just hearing the part of the story we just listened to where she described just a little bit of the violence that happened, I, I was holding back tears. When I wrote the service description for the newsletter, I thought to myself, no one is gonna come to this service. I thought, how can I write a summary of what I'm going to say that won't keep people from coming to church? I don't know. But I do know that we need to talk about domestic violence. Its impact is so huge. It happens in all kinds of intimate relationships. It happens to men as well as women. It happens in gay and lesbian relationships. It is very prevalent in intimate relationships among teenagers. One in three female teenagers have experienced violence in a dating relationship. One in three. According to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, one in nine men have been the victim of severe physical violence by an intimate partner. That's a significant percentage of men, one in nine. That means if there are 20 men here today attending our service, it's statistically likely that there are two men here today who've been the victim of severe physical violence by an intimate partner. It also needs to be em emphasized that dom domestic violence has a much greater effect on women than on men. It happens to women more often than it happens to men, and the degree of domestic violence against women is usually much more severe. Let's unpack that a little bit. 85% of victims of domestic violence are women. And female vi victims of intimate partner violence usually experience multiple forms of violence, including being raped and being stalked, while most men only experience physical violence. Women are also more than 10 times more likely to be killed by an intimate partner. The National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey tells us that one in four women have been the victim of severe physical violence by an intimate partner. One in four. That means that if there are 40 women here today, I, I didn't choose, choose these numbers at random. We usually have about 20 men and about 40 women. If there are 40 women here today, it's statistically likely that 10 have been the victim of severe physical violence by an intimate partner. One in four women. And most female victims of physical violence in an intimate relationship have also been stalked by their partner and or raped by their partner. For black women, American Indian women, and transgender women, the rate is one in two. One in every two black women have been the victims of domestic violence. One in every two American Indian women have been the victims of domestic violence. One in every two transgender women have been the victims of domestic violence. And rates are even higher for disabled women. Three out of five. So let's talk a little bit about the cause of intimate partner violence and what we can do about it. As our quote from Audre Lorde reminds us, there's no single issue. It's always an intersection of issues, and that's true also for the causes of domestic violence, which are multiple and overlapping. Domestic violence happens at all socioeconomic levels to rich and to poor. Even though I mentioned higher rates for certain women, remember, one in four is the average, even before it starts going up. But it's also much more common in lower socioeconomic classes than it is among the middle class and the upper class. According to Neil Jacobson and John Gottman, where violence in general is common, so is violence against women. 
all of the economic forces which operate to protect, perpetuate class differences, racism, and poverty contribute to high rates of battering. Still, the main risk factor for being a victim of domestic violence is being a woman. Dawn Bradley Berry writes, domestic violence against women is as old as recorded history. It has been reported in virtually all societies and in most countries it has been both legal and socially accepted until very recently. In the 1800s in America, women were still considered the property of their husbands and beating your wife was still legal. And as recently as the late 1970s, so just about 50 years ago, a Harris poll found that one out of five Americans still approved of a man hitting his wife under some circumstances. Jacobson, Gottman, and others agree that the subordination of women to men throughout the history of human civilization is the central cause of domestic violence. Throughout the recorded history, patriarchy has sanctioned the battering of women, and it continues to operate to do that today. Jacobson and Gottman are blunt and to the point on this issue, stating that the continued oppression of women provides a context that makes efforts to end violence against women difficult, if not impossible. This is why Jackson Katz tells us that violence against women is a men's issue. We don't usually focus on men. Usually the focus is on the women victimized by men. Here's what Jacobson and Gottman have to say, elaborating on this. Battering cannot be changed through the actions on the part of the victim. The violence of battering men has no consistent triggers. There is nothing the woman is doing to cause the man to be violent. And since nothing she is doing is causing him to be violent, nothing that she does will stop him from being violent. In fact, Jacobson and Godman have found that women typically responded calmly when their abusive partners reacted to normal, everyday requests with emotional abuse. Jacobson and Gottman found that women victims of domestic abuse generally responded with integrity and engaged in skillful emotional defense when their battering partners began escalating towards physical violence through the form of the use of emotional violence. The women were angry, as they should be, but usually still respectful as they opposed the name calling and threats and irrational accusations lobbied against them by the battering partner. Their responses in no way caused the man's physical violence. And regardless of how skillful their responses didn't keep the physical violence from happening or stop it once it started. And just in case you have a little voice in your head, it's okay if you have that voice. This is a structural issue that's been here for all of our history. But in case you have that voice and you want to blame women for not leaving, let me share a few things with you. Up to 75% of battering victims have left or are trying to leave men who will not let them go. Studies of women killed by a husband or a boyfriend show that 90% of the women had reported at least one prior incident of abuse. The average number of calls to a scene before a domestic homicide is eight. And women who have divorced or separated from their abusers report being battered 14 times as often as those still living with their partners. It's estimated that 73% of emergency room visits and up to 75% of calls to the police for domestic violence incidents occur after separation. Just to put these homicide statistics in context, the Black Lives Matter movement is most directly a movement in opposition to police violence against unarmed black people. 
And al although black men make up only 6% of the US population, they account for 40% of unarmed men killed by police. That works to, out to about 40 or so unarmed black men killed by police each year. Meanwhile, every month, so that's each year, every month, an average of 70 women are killed by an intimate partner. That's about 1,500 women killed by domestic violence each year. By husbands and ex-husbands, boyfriends and estranged lovers. During the time our country was engaged in war efforts in Afghanistan and Iraq, over 7,000 US troops were killed over that 20 year period. During that same time period, nearly 12,000 women were killed by domestic violence. It's almost twice as much. Think about the media coverage, the number of protests there were against the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And then think about how often you have heard about domestic violence in the news. How many protests? We're studying reproductive justice as our social justice focus for study and action this year. We do one every year. Last year was transgender justice, before that racial justice, before that environmental justice. The reproductive year is the most dangerous year for a woman, the time that she's at greatest risk for a domestic violence homicide. Women in the US who are pregnant or who have recently given birth are more likely to be murdered than to die from obstetric causes. Homicide deaths among pre pregnant women are more prevalent than deaths from hypertensive disorders, hemorrhage, or sepsis. Take that in just for a moment. We know that maternal mortality rates, because we've been studying it this year, maybe you knew before, are sky high in America, and yet the biggest cost of a mother's life is murder by an intimate partner. Also, when women lose reproductive access, they become even more vulnerable to what's called reproductive coercion. That means the intimate partner can force them into sex, can take away their birth control, their access to care, it's still true today in Missouri that there's a law that a woman can't get divorced while pregnant. Today, in the state of Missouri. So let's go back to what's going on here. Why is domestic violence such a big problem in the United States and all over the world? Why do so many ab men abuse physically, emotionally, verbally, and other ways, the women and girls, and the men and boys that they claim to love? What's going on with men? And what is the role of the, the various institutions in our society in addressing this issue? Because it isn't really about individual perpetrators. Katz tells us that's a naive way to understand what is a much deeper and more systematic social problem. I don't know the numbers of how many men are committing abuse, but if one in four women are the victims, you can just imagine, this is an epidemic. Remember in our story, the parts about how the abuser was loving and gentle in other moments. This is a systemic issue. Perpetrators aren't monsters who crawl out of the swamp and come into town and do their nasty business and then retreat into the darkness. They're much more normal and everyday than that. So the question we need to ask is, 
what are we doing here in our society? What are the roles of various institutions that help to produce abusive men? And what can we do to transform this aspect of our society? What's the role of religious belief systems, the sports culture, the pornography culture, the family structure, economics, and how all of that intersects race and ethnicity and how that intersects? How does all of this work? I'm going to keep quoting Jackson Katz. He says, and then once we start making those connections and asking those important and big questions, then we can talk about how we can be transformative. In other words, how we can do something differently, how we can change the socialization of boys and the definitions of manhood that lead to these outcomes. These are the kinds of questions we need to be asking. Some of these things we're doing right here in this congregation. One important way to counter and transform intimate partner violence is by teaching children and youth healthy relationship skills, which is happening literally right now at this moment downstairs as our our whole life sexuality education is being offered to our fourth through sixth graders. This re-education also includes education and empowerment of bystanders, teaching children and youth how to speak up when women and girls are being demeaned. That was covered, by the way, in the very first session of OWL for fourth through sixth graders. I heard about it from my 10-year-old. Violence in general and violence against women in particular happens on a continuum. I've said it before, but I'm going to say it again. It's not a personal problem. It's a societal problem. So when a man says something sexist or degrading or harassing about women, instead of laughing or pretending you didn't hear it, we need to say, we especially need men to say, hey, that's not funny. You know, that could be my sister you're talking about. Why don't we joke about something else? I don't appreciate that kind of talk. It's an example of a bystander approach. In a bystander approach, people are given the tools to interrupt the process, to speak up and create a peer culture climate where abusive behavior will be seen as unacceptable. Not just because it's illegal, but because it's wrong and unacceptable in the peer culture. And because it's a systemic issue, countering domestic violence also means addressing poverty. It also means addressing racism. It also means addressing transphobia. It also means improving how we support families, financially and otherwise. I encourage you to get involved in one of the many organizations that exist to counter domestic violence, to donate money to an organization working to counter domestic violence and support victims of domestic violence, organizations and programs which across the board are underfunded. I encourage you to advocate for better enforcement of laws against domestic violence, for stiffer sentencing of offenders. In closing, May we stand up to the injustices of violence against women so that nothing evil can cross the door of any home. With faith made strong, let us counter the storm of male violence against women. With faith made strong, let us build the society into a shelter that keeps out the deathly chill of domestic violence. These sheltering walls may seem thin, but our everyday efforts to counter a culture of male domination over women and girls can keep hate out. Our everyday efforts can make our homes safe and make peace walk softly through its rooms until every corner and every house becomes a sanctuary, a place of healing, of love, of respect, of dignity, and of justice. May it be so, and may we be among those who make it so.
Amen, 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 and blessed be. A change is going to come, y'all.